Good evening. You're listening live to the Extreme Movie Show. I'm your host, Rob, broadcasting to you from the Extreme Studios in the Pinos Palace, just west of Orlando, Florida, on a balmy 87 degree, slightly overcast day here in Central Florida. I have on the sat line here from the great Midwest himself, RDV. And tonight, RDV, we are going over, I believe it's 1989, our films, as we're wrapping up, taking a look at the 80s decade, just kind of rehashing some stuff here, too. And boy, to use that expression from last week, which is annoying the last time I'm going to do it, we got a bunch of bangers here tonight. <laughs> bangers, uh, ballers, you know, I don't know. A collection it's, of decent movies that are okay, but... Straight to DVD movies. Yeah, or yeah. straight to VHS. His VHS was just uh, about happening right around this time, I believe. Oh, it's been around for about 10 years at this point. Thank Legend you, uh, adult film industry, for leading the charge, t- technologically speaking. <laughs> hey, I, you can't knock the adult film co- uh, industry. They're the reason why we have uh, chat rooms and uh, <laughs> messengers. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's start chatting about some runner-ups. Now, again, ladies and gentlemen, as, as we file yeah. in, here on the Extreme Movie Show, uh, five years into it, we've um, gotten an uptick in subscribers and said, you know what, let's revisit some of our older material. What we like to do occasionally is do themes, and one of the themes we have as an 80s-based channel is top tens, not in any particular order yeah. as far as like the most or best ones or our favorites or whatever, but just collections of films that are noteworthy to talk about, plus runner-ups. So go ahead and get us going there, RDB. All so right. Dive right in. Going with our first runner-up, came out on January 13th. It is Gleam in the Cube. I know uh, you might have wanted this in your top 10, and I was going to confused by some of the lists, but I was going through, and I was like, it's one of them I do love. I have it on VHS. I love the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, this was late 80s, uh, just about the, on the cusp of 90s, skateboarding, Tony Hawk. Uh, and I... Uh, out of this guy basically he, he hates his set his uh family he, you know uh christian slater plays a rebellious teenager uh he has a goody to uh stepbrother asian stepbrother who uh, ends up getting murdered and he wants to find out well who killed him you know it's like you know and because he's a delinquent no one no one uh, likes him you know trusts him so so he ends up uh with his friends solving the the murder We'll be talking more about Christian's later dude uh, in this uh, cast, I think. Yeah. And, but one of the things I wanted to point out, uh, two quick things, is one, having that whole old Hitchcock, and I'm only saying Hitchcock not because he created it, but because he glamorized it at times, taking an average person, throwing them in an unusual situation, see how they respond. You get that here because you're right in the 80s. Oh, my gosh, somebody was a delinquent and nobody will talk to him, but yet he's got a murder to solve. This is actually one of the few movies of the 80s yeah. that, when we went to go watch it, I said, you know, I don't think I've ever seen it. Let me watch it. And I was surprised. It's actually fairly entertaining. And it's not the schlocky crap that here in the mid to late 80s a lot of movies have turned out to. This mm-hmm. is this is a decent watch. I agree with you. It's, it's very likable. Uh, and it's got I, some I, good action skate, action film sequences. <laughs> too. You know, we talk about Sharky's Machine and practical yeah, effects yeah. and people jumping out and all that. This one's pretty good. When it, when it comes to Christian Slater movies, I'm guilty as charged, man. I, I watch Pump Up the Volume and all those other ones. Yeah, had. me too. Even Alone in the Dark, as bad as that movie that is. <laughs> I, I don't know. Very, I would say my favorite thing of it, uh, if we're talking Christian Slater movies, um, this is outside the 80s. Man, I'm trying to think. Uh, my favorite movie by him probably is Very Bad Things. Yes, a tremendous film. Uh, that's well. probably it. You know, and and uh, get all that girl crap when they did. You know, uh, they did just recently did one, uh, 2017 with uh, what's your name? Uh, the girl version of Scarlett Johansson, Rough Night. No, oh. that was a gender flip version of that. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> when I learned oh. that, I was like, because I, I read the synopsis, like. I've never heard this movie before, and I'm like, "Oh, it's oh, this is very bad things where a male a male prostitute male stripper dies at a, at a, at a party, a party with girls." I was like, "Was the girl like picking up the stripper who I assume was you know played both yeah. sides and pegging him or something against the wall like like in, in very well, I, bad I didn't things?" I had to watch it. I just saw the okay. trailer for it, and I just laughed because like this is very bad things. Uh, Not gonna I, lie. Yeah. This is an interesting title for a movie, Gleaming the Cube. I have no idea what the hell it means, but it's no, cool when no, you see it. No. It draws your attention in. But the, the, like you said, when it comes to 80s uh, movies with like with interesting songs, this wasn't a banger hit, but it was still like, you know, it's like, I, I can jam to this, you know? I can listen to my car or my Walkman, you know? 
Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm the pro- I mean, where the hell do I even find it on cassette? <laughs> Is there even a soundtrack for this movie available of purchase? But uh, yeah, I've been doing some discovery. I found a site that has me, I guess, all the 80s uh, movies and all their big hits in the one album. <laughs> that would be something. Yeah. Dude, yeah. So anyway, um, going into our number, number, our second uh, runner up of the night, um, it is well, March 3rd. And it is uh, actually one of your picks. I've heard of this movie, but never watch it. Skin Deep. Tremendously funny movie uh, with John Ritter. We would know him, obviously, in Bad Santa and, of course, Three's Company as an actor. Yeah. I, I, Three's Company is kind of as a show. It would be on, and you're watching it, and, the, you know, it's kind of really cheesy, even by today's standards, but people like him and all that. He's tremendous in this movie. This, Blake Edwards is the guy that did the Pink Panther, and... Mm-hmm. It was funny watching this, and all I'm going to sit there and say is, you watch this, don't read anything about it, and it's worth it alone for the condom scene. Yeah, and with, I don't know, it's just me, when, it, when, I, when I see John Ritter with a beard, it just makes me feel weird. It, because well, I, I agree. I, I, it's, I'm so used to him with a clean shave, you know, no matter what movie he's in, and then seeing him having that beard there, it's like, I feel like we're going. he's going to start preaching to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and the car. Okay, all right. So our next one is uh, well, it's the first of uh, well, two water movies that came out in the in the eighties, ladies, especially this year, March March seventeenth. It is Leviathan. What uh, was your take on this? A creature featured man. Yeah. A lot of these. Yeah, the creature wasn't. It was okay, but it was kind of like a thing underwater. The aliens. This is not a bad movie. It's no. just one that you go, what is it? When did it come out? Did I ever see it? Because it was lost at the well, time. But it's got people in it. It's got Richard Cronin. It's got Peter Weller in it. I, I mean, Ernie Hudson's in it. Daniel Stern. I mean, Hector yeah. Zondo or whatever the hell his name is. He was uh, around for a bit. It's it's there. It's not bad. I always get this confused. Is this a James Cameron movie, or is that the no, other one? That's the other <laughs> one. That's, that's what I mean. Because they they are they they both take place underwater. There's both horror events. You know, there's you know, and just like yeah, it's and like this is either the Ed Harris one or the Ed Harris is in the other one. You know, it's like it's it's like they said. I always get these two movies confused. So uh, this guy movie. who did it, Cosmatos Senior, yeah. He'd only did like a handful of films, but he had just got done doing Rambo Part Two, I think, a couple years before, and he also did Cobra. And then oh. after this, he would go on to do Tombstone, and then some movie called Shadow wow. of Fear. Say, so, yeah, no, I'm serious. This guy's got an eye. It's an, it's an interesting looking film, but the residuals, I've what I heard or read from the DVD sales on Tombstone, yeah. were enough to finance his son in one of his movies that had. Um, that came out uh was a beyond a black rainbow and then the uh one that has nicholas cage in it the color of night or not the color of night that's bruce willis but the one we've reviewed here that's like a uh, hp lovecraftian type thing and all oh, that. the color of money the color, color of money but, but color of something whatever uh, whatever the hell it is the nick cage we reviewed both here but his son's got a really interesting take on it oh, but color purple his father God damn it! This is annoying to me. I'm gonna have to friggin' Google it. Well, I you say, I get it. It, you start saying color stuff. I think I think of Bruce Willis with the with the. the so does everybody. Girl. That's why yeah. it's one of our biggest <laughs> ones. Mandy. Mandy. Okay. Mandy. Guys. Yeah. Well, Crazy Batch on Mandy, where they go to kill his wife and torture him or yeah, whatever. Yeah. But, well, it's the same guy. It's the same guy who did the color of purple, or was you know was it? Was, well, it was, we don't need to talk about that. Yeah, it was. It, yeah. But it's funny how we have these little. Um connections because hollywood's a lot smaller and the more we talk yeah. about stuff, especially from the 80s we can see where things have branched out from it i mean and uh again it's this is not a bad movie at all if you're really hardcore in the 80s or you like creature features it's one of those things when you're watching you're going it's not yeah. bad but then you go where did all the creature feature films go to in the 80s because there wasn't yeah. that many so instead of watching whatever that christian stewart underwater movie watch this there you go <laughs> all right all right, our, our next runner-up, real quick, like going through here, is uh, one that I know you're going to be mad because it wasn't on the on the top ten. Because uh, only because let me know don't know here. Only I know because I, I I took our t- his list, and my list, put together. Pixel obviously isn't here; didn't show up, so he didn't give me a list. So uh, I tried to do my best to so make a split down, so we all had a equal representation here. 
So our next one uh, got bumped the runners up, and uh, it also came out the same day as this, and it is also clutch cheating. You know, I can understand this beyond runner ups. Honestly, I don't dislike it. It's not a great film. It definitely, when you watch it, you go, "Yeah, it's definitely a lesser film." But I think Fletch is one of the best comedies of the '80s. And but really, it's Fletch to me is man. Has there been a comic that's had a long and decent career as Chevy Chase has had, mm-hmm. as far as being and on top? And he's had some misses, but this I, one, is, I gotta it, it's, it's solid. I gotta applaud him. He did every character in this movie by himself. No. <laughs> <laughs> this here, here's the thing i will say about fletch lives yep. it came out way too late however when i watched it at it a like four years show, like four or five years after the movie exactly the first one. It, was, it was four um i watched it at a preview uh with e from i love comics and it was a situation i think summer of 89 where they were doing previews from a radio station so they got a bunch of people in here we managed to win tickets we went and they had all these gadgets they had like they had the fletch purse with all the disguises in it and, the, and all that so as well as kind of cool swag mm-hmm. bag type gifts yeah. that people talk on the mic before the movie so people had a really good time but the thing is, is when you watch the film it definitely feels like fletch the character but you go what's what's missing you know and you realize that his take on the Fletch novels, which had been around since the seventies, yeah. actually, um, it's just different. It'd been, it'd been interesting if he continued this up a little bit because it's not a bad film. And Chevy would, Chase, it's all because of him. Would you say it suffers the same fate or same uh, light setback as uh, Ghostbusters Two? Too far apart. You know, it's possible because I'm telling you, I think I I, I really do believe in like 88, 89, you're starting to go, things are changing culturally, mm-hmm. not just with music, but movies and everything to television shows. It doesn't have the same feel that the 80s had, say, in the early to mid 80s. And uh, it's hard to say, but as we start diving into the 90s and redoing some of our 90s content, and relooking at some stuff, I, we'll continue to talk about how these trends have changed. Mm-hmm. All right. I think Ghostbusters 2, they come up, was it, was it this year? I believe it was. Oh, I overlooked it. Oh, well. It's not on any of the lists. As it shouldn't be. (laughs) (laughs) All right. right. And maybe because there's, even even now, even even knowing it, there's a lot better movies on here that I have than the Ghostbusters 2. Yeah. Uh, All right. Our our next one is uh, April 21st. And uh, some would say it's one of the best, best baseball movies. I got a confession to make. I've only seen parts of this movie because I, I, if it's really? a baseball movie, other than the natural, I said I don't, I don't want to see it. Why? Because it's baseball. Well, I know it's, it's not baseball. To me, it's kind of like frequency, in a sense. The yeah. guy, he has, just he has this, you know, dream to build it, baseball field, and he uh, builds it, and then he starts seeing these guys showing up, and they start playing baseball, and then he recognizes one of them was actually his dad. His yeah. like dad passed away. Yeah. Uh, and and so, James Earl Jones is in it. it it's a good yeah. film. Is a w- way for him to interact with this guy, you know, even though the guy has no idea that it's his son, you know, yeah. he owns yeah. the field. So that was, that was a really good movie, like I said, yeah, because you had this, he had um, The Natural. Um, what was the other one with Bill Major Pullman? League. Yeah, there was a Bill Pullman one too, is what? Yeah. I what this is Kevin Costner's yeah. uh, star appeal was, was definitely growing. Starting to grow. He was becoming a name at this time. Yeah. All right. All right. Going on to our number, a uh, number would be a number seven or number six, actually. July 29th. Turner and Hooch. I think we reviewed this. I'm not a big yeah. Tom Hanks fan, as you no. know. No, it, yes, same it's here. There. It's just uh, so I, this is better than big to me. You know, uh, I, I, I would agree I, with you. Yeah, everybody. Everybody talks about how how big is one of the big things. He has a big giant piano. He talks about all he jumps on there. This was more fun because he's because this is kind of like the Burbs humor, where he's kind of like stuck with this dog, and this dog is disgusting. It it burps, it passes gas, you know, it, it it throws up, you know, or, you know, and just and he's forced. And then and then when he has it, the best thing I've ever seen is he cracks open a beer. Here you want some? He pours it in the, in the dish for the for the dog. <laughs> Um, because another movie came out this in the same year, it was called K9, uh, yeah, with right. Jim Belushi. Jim Belushi. And I, I, this was the better. Um, every kid at least 12 years old should watch this movie at least once. <laughs> All right, yeah. going on to our next one, uh, come out in August 4th. And before he did all the escape plans, he was locked up. Yeah. It's uh, another stolen action movie that you could almost forget if you had to eliminate a whole bunch of them. It's solid though. It's 
Um, there's a scene here where they got vehicle plan and they're all working on a car together mm -hmm. and doing a big bonding thing. Okay, but do you really remember that much about it? No. Donald Sutherland's a bad guy, though, which is fun. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll take it. Yep. <laughs> and he's wearing a wife beater, too, by the way. Dude, you know. I was going through, through trying to get thumbnails for this, and there is about a million posters for this movie. Yeah. Well, people it's, liked uh, it. It's well, and, you know, just different, different countries or regions, you know, they had different posters and stuff. There was a, Most there was of the actually, overseas ones are really good. Yeah. So I've noticed that too. It's like, man, but like even this is kind of cool. This, this is the VHS cover. All right. Our next runner up, going quickly, going over here, is actually the other water movie we're talking about. Uh, Occupy on August 9th is called The Abyss. This is Cameron, and this is very good. I remember yeah. watching it. Yeah. It was kind of a slow, moderate, deliberate tone to it, uh, but it's got some tension behind it. And if you didn't know this is the Terminator guy, um, you're like, oh, really? Then you start realizing it's done pretty damn well. And even though we've talked about spectacles in the 80s and blockbuster franchise type films starting with, you know, you could argue Superman, you could say Star Wars, of course, in the indie. I think The Abyss is pretty interesting because it's a water thing. And of course, Cameron's got a massive love for water and, and everything, too. And it's a part of who he is as a person, which you don't know that watching this film, but you're like, man, whoever did this just got the right eye for it. And again, uh, Thunderball yeah. back in the sixties was like the cutting edge of technology for under, under water fights and bomb yeah, films yeah. and stuff. The best man, this you watch it. You didn't see anything like this before. Well, I'm going to say right aliens now, aliens underwater, basically. Well, yeah. Kind of. Aliens, anything underwater, whether it's sharks or anything, just, just being this far underwater here, like, uh, it, it is disturbing. Yeah. Because, and the other thing is, it's true, it's true. It's true. We know more about what's in space than we know what's in our ocean. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's so, very and, 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 yeah and, uh, you said, I, I think this, this is the one now I'm thinking because I get, I get right. I get this and I get the Leviathan. The Leviathan. Always confused. This is the one where the guy's vehicle, submarine falls and crushes, right? You know, that the scene I remember clearly is where Those what's her, the, the, the woman she's got to basically they're in an air pocket and she's yeah. basically saying, I have to die and drown because, you know, otherwise I'll get damaged. And if you can carry me enough there quick enough, you might be able to resuscitate me. So she delivery has to like let herself drown and yeah, it's done well. The, yeah. Yeah. But I remember like the guy in a submarine gets crushed. I think it was Michael Bien. I forget who it was. Uh, but he was basically the obsessors are just trying to kill him. And like, you know, and I remember they, Get to the surface, but uh, disturbing. Yeah, um, good good. But uh, good CGI though. You can see, you can see what we was going to do for Terminator Two. You see the the alien in this. You see the water they face. Like, oh, that's the T one thousand. You know, like our, or, you know, for T two. Right. Yeah, all right. Our next one is a uh, well. I, I throw it on because it's not often do I find a, a Patrick Swayze movie that I actually that isn't Footloose or Roadhouse, and I'm not Footloose, but not Roadhouse or, or uh, Dirty Dancing. And uh, this came on October twentieth. This is the next of ten. Oh my! I, I, uh, I, 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 man, <laughs> this is. I, I, when I saw this, I was like, "Okay, how, how the hell are they going to pull this off?" And then at the end of the movie, you're like, "Well, I guess I watched it." <laughs> he went from ghost to the next to can he getting the justice for his brother and well, i think i think ghost is next actually next year oh think, is it yeah well, i think so yeah uh, um what is it he's uh shooting homemade bow and arrow somewhere like on a chicago subway or something that's that's all i gotta say <laughs> it does not have the same coolness as Death no. Wish three or four or whatever the one that Bronson's getting all his weapons from mail orders. <laughs> Los Angeles. It's not the same. <laughs> There's a theme here of Chicago getting beat up by everybody. <laughs> all right, our next one came out in uh, November 10th. Uh, well, it is uh, the best of the best, Eric Roberts. Uh, straight to VHS movie. Yeah, it obviously feels like it should have been, if it wasn't. Uh, I'm always surprised when I find out there's a movie that that wasn't straight to VHS. It was actually in the theaters for like I mean, just even one or two theaters. I was like, really? It's like uh, I, I guess that's why they decided to go with VHS more because. And that's the thing I, I can't. That's the thing I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to stress too much. You know, I can't. I can't do that enough. Just because a movie goes straight to VHS and not the theaters means means it's a bad movie. I love, I love all the Dolph Lundgren movies, man. Going straight to VHS. 
to me, well, uh, it's another me, model, right? It's, it's yeah, you know, um, and back then you can actually go buy a straight to DVD or straight to VHS movie and still get a decent movie. Nowadays, it's like, uh, yeah, you know, you can't really trust many movies you buy because a lot of movies are just kind of there's no there's no originality. A- anyway, this is taking off, uh, launching off with a uh, well, blood sport. Yeah. This is another. This is another one. They're doing this the best, the best. You know, a team about karate stuff. Uh, ironically, it's not the only uh, karate movie coming out this year, um, but uh, way better than Karate Kid. And I always think of Tony Silver when I ever see Eric Roberts. Oh, he does have that kind of look in here too. Obviously, a lot shorter, <laughs> smaller. But uh, and no, James you're right. Joe, James Earl Jones out of nowhere <laughs> is popping in one of these movies. Like I said, this like I said, this is a movie that I would be not be surprised if it went to uh, straight to DVD because I know the sequel did. The sequel had to have gone. There's no way it's in the theaters. No, but. and 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 even though we were starting to talk lately about the transition of the older action stars to more yeah. guns and, and less hand to hand stuff, here you still had some fighting stuff with JCVD and Seagal. Um, Jeff Speakman's movie would still come out, but. These were still a cool thing to see. And if you were hardcore mm-hmm. to martial arts, this is what you latched onto. Because surprisingly, I should say unsurprisingly, yeah. we talked about how all this ninja crap yeah. ninja phrase is dying out at this point. Yes. Unfortunately, there's no, sadly. There's no retreat, no surrender. Uh, so we're going to go for the best of the best. And uh, this is another movie, another banger movie, having a, a nice little soundtrack, a little song here, the best of the best song. Uh, like you said, there's like, <laughs> it's just these generic soundtracks, you know, not the not the greatest. You know, they're not Top Gun, you know, you're not getting Kenny Kenny Loggins, but you're getting you're getting um uh, like I think it's John Farrell or whatever his name is, who also did the uh, Rad Thunder in the Heart and stuff. Right. You know, a lot of these, there's all these guys who basically like they they you like or like Stan Bush. It's another guy. He did a lot of songs. You know, he did for the um, Kickboxer. He did one too, and it's it the one hit wonders. They're, they're the studio guys that work in the studios and. These are decent hits. You know? This is good as anything you'd, you'd see on cable today. Pretty much. Um, I'm surprised this wasn't like a straight to cable. You know? Yeah. Or made not, for cable. Yeah. It, it, it's a niche film if you're into that sort of thing. Watch it. Yeah. Like and there's like it. six of them or something like that now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Our last runner up for the evening came out December of 20 seconds. And it is, uh, well, it's another Stallone movie. It is Tango and Cash with Kurt Russell. And I, and I and I I, gra- I grabbed the German one back because I didn't, didn't realize that. <laughs> these these <laughs> wheels, these cups, von Ella Emerson. Uh, anyway, if if you're watching this movie, there's there's three reasons. The number one reason you're watching for the hot re- uh, Terry Young Hatcher before she joined uh, Dean Kane on Spring Lois, and uh, Kurt Russell was on fire. You know, um, yeah. having done the thing, uh, and a few other movies. You know, uh, Escape from New York stuff uh of course stallone was kind of uh going into different roles i noticed this you know because we had rambo you know we had rocky now we're getting him in, in tango cash you know uh soon we'll have in the 90s we'll have the specialist mm-hmm. you know assassins yep. so it, it was, like i said it was it was interesting because he looks like harold ramus in this photo well, he did actually try to dress up and look this yeah, yeah. way at this point in his career. But, and, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he don't forget what Best Little Horror House in Texas was he in that one. Whatever, Rhinestone, that's the one I'm thinking Rhin- of. Rhinestone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, was, he was willing to try things out in characters. I give him a lot of credit for don't it. Don't stop so. my mom will shoot. Well, I think he allowed himself to be the clean-cut guy to allow oh. Kurt Russell to come in and be his scraggly-looking self. Really. And it kind of reminds me of, uh, was it, um... Uh, lightning and thunder, or was it, or thunder, or was thunder and light, thunderbolt light. lightning? Yeah, the Clint Eastwood uh movie with uh Jeff Bridges, remember that one? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's kind of the same thing, both <laughs> both partners dressed up in a, as a girl for, for a thing. So it was, it was, it was, it was interesting, to say the least. I still watch, I still like to watch Lockup, Lockup's more fun. The thing with gosh, I mean. Kurt Russell's been in, been in everything since he was a kid, so good on um, probably sixty plus years. I mean, I know he's in the seventies now, and he's yeah. already been a name. But you're right; he he was definitely hot right now. Overboard had come out. Tequila Sunrise's movie; it's been on our shortlist forever. Mm-hmm. This one, uh, he'd do all, all different things. I think this movie's more about Kurt Russell than it is Stallone. Really, I think Stallone Kurt, gave him the yeah. rub. 
Yeah, uh, Kurt Russell being the the new upcoming detective, and here is the Seath guy, the the, the, the big piece of the expert guy, and then his daughter. You find you find out is is supposed to be um, uh, ah, crap! It is it is a Terry Hatcher, you know? yeah. And then yeah. she's uh, dancing up on stage. Is that it's just like, ooh, um, but uh. Yeah, it's a, like I said, it's it's a decent movie. Um, there is some zip line action <laughs> with belts. <laughs> for for the younger listeners, he's Mr. What? Is it Mr. Nobody in the Fast and the Furious movies? Or at least yeah. a couple of them are a character. So yeah. um, he had said he was pretty much retired because he did a couple of those Christmas yeah. movies or whatever, which whatever, but never say never as far as a concern. And really, he, he's a guy that, man, he, he's like Eric Roberts does a lot, and you know that's a shtick. But I'll watch anything that has Kurt Russell in it, right? And I forget who the bad guy was in this. So, but it's always like the bad guys are always like they're they're not Jack Palance, but they could be like Jack Palance is like cousin. That's how good they are. <laughs> they're like there's always like the, the angry white guy. You know, he's always like you know he's a, he's a he's either he's a corrupt cop or he's a politician. You know, it's just, I, love, I love it. Right. All right. All right, getting back to Christian Slater. <laughs> All right, now we're in the now we're in the ten films of the year, and we go in order when they release, yes. not by yep. ranking or anything else. Yep. Go. March thirty first, probably the only movie I like Winona Ryder in. I know you're not the biggest Winona Ryder fan, and I never yeah. disliked her or loved her. She was just sort of there to me. It's, it's, I, she was yeah. different than all the ditzy blondes you had in the '80s. Heather's though is dark and it's not cute. You you think it is, and then I remember people telling me. Oh no no no! It's not it's not, and romance. a lot of people were confused no, what this movie it is. is. Yeah, this isn't true. This isn't a true romance. No, no, no. This is a guy. Uh, Christian Slater is a serial killer. Or he is what he wants to know. He, not a serial killer, but he wants to know what it's like to kill and stuff. You know, he's got this big old forty-five. You know, dirty hair. You know, the Magnum. Uh, and he kind of takes he takes advantage of this girl. Uh, when played by one of the writer is being, well, she's being bullied. By Mean Girls, that's right. Uh, and they decided to take out thing what one by one. <laughs> I love <And>, it. <laughs> oh, I, I, yes, yes. I mean, and they're not having fun doing it. This is stressful for them. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you want some? Uh, here, it's blue raspberry uh, lemonade. You know, you know. Do you want to try something? It's like yeah, it's a, it's like a uh, drainal. Uh, uh, oh God. Like I said at the end, like I said, like it, it's just like it, it's it's how it turns out for another writer and Christian Slater is the only way it can happen. I won't spoil it, but I'll just say if you haven't watched this, you need to at least watch it once. Uh, Christian Slater always is, like I said, he's and you said you said his melts too. He's young Jack Nicholson, you know. Yeah. And yeah. and literally, I can see it. And some people say like, "Oh, I hate it because he's just trying to be Jack Nicholson." Honestly, it works for him, and that and that's and that's all that matters. You know, I I like I like he I like it. In most of his movies, he does. Like I said he had the best Breaking In show that was on Fox, and they canceled after one season. Stupid. Some people, uh, when, when they're acting, they have a little thing. Some people get like a yeah. like Liam Neeson. Yeah, everyone always thought he was okay and fine, but it wasn't until he did Taken, in my opinion, that you know people oh, were like, definitely. "Holy shit!" Right? Yeah. Christian had. No matter, no matter what you say about him being like Jack Nicholson, he had kind of this like adult, not not cynicism to him, but he had kind of this sensibility about him when he would talk. So even when he was young in movies, it was almost mm -hmm. like he was the one that, that that saw like, no, no, this isn't how things are. This is how it should be. And he yeah. always seemed to struggle with that. And at least, you know, I mean, Gleaming the Cube. Okay, look, yeah. that's the kind of role he should be in. And this, and this, when this came out, it, how do I say it? It wasn't an independent film per se. Mm -hmm. A lot of people treat it as one because it was too dark, especially at this time for the 80s. I mean, it, everything was so horribly bland and vanilla and just, but that's what was out there. And then this came along and it really showed the flip side of high school. And we talked about how yes. dirty and gritty things were looking in the 70s and early 80s and then and bullies, bully movies and stuff like that. And now everything's clean cut. Then you get Heathers back there. This is a breath of fresh air when it came out. It is a good movie. It is. Like I said Christian Slater. Like I said he. You're right. He always plays the older roles. He's always got the cigarette, pump of the volume. He's yep. you know, calling the dolls and their bullshit. Uh, he's always yeah the rebellious teenager, and I like it. Um, you know. So anyway, 
But going on to our second of the top 10, this came out April 7th. This is Dead Calm, one of the best movies I've seen with Billy Zane and Sam Neill. And I always forget that Nicole Kidman's in there. But I'll, I'll just say, you're, you're uh, hey, you come across, there are two, there's a couple, they're sailing, they're on a go, you know, and they're hanging out together. And then they come across this guy on this, like a little dinghy boat, you know, degree, and they bring him in. And then, like I said, it just gets more and more tense because now, do we trust this guy? It's like pitching up a hitchhiker. You know, do we believe his story? You know, this is what really happened. You know, and Sam Elliott, uh, or sorry, Sam Elliott, but sorry, Sam Neill is trying, basically just trying to get his, uh, you know, protect his wife from this Billy Zane guy. And Billy Zane plays a really crazy guy in this. I love it. Yeah. Um, Shammy wasn't Lex Luthor. They well, this. this is before people kind of made fun of Billy Zane for yeah. whatever reason. And this is also when uh, Twin Peaks was getting ready to go. And, it, you know, he became a character in season two with it. And I think from then on, it was kind of lampooned, even though he's funny in there. Um, this movie is is very good. It's it's very quiet. Um, if people forget. I think I think Sam Neill's Australian, as is Nicole Kidman. And mm-hmm. She might have been in a few small things before yeah. this. So this is before the uh, you know half a million dollars worth of whatever she's done to her face kind of thing. Very natural looking kind of beauty to it. it. It just feels a little different than an American film when you're watching it. And it's just one of those kind of simple films that you're really watching people act and do stuff that's not about plot per se or whatever. It's more mm-hmm. about the human condition and, of course, the isolation that you have being on the boat and the guy trying to protect his wife. You have a lot of these little different elements to it that you go ah, yeah. but, it, but but it builds up as it goes on right yeah you, you, so, you got a flare gun to defend yourself that's pretty much about it you're in these, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're lucky a knife but uh <laughs> well here's the thing a lot of times people will, will do yeah. a movie and it's really of course about you know relationships and whatever the excuse is of the scenario and you pay attention to and you know, this one really dies dies into the to the whatever, and you know the way people are making goo goo eyes at each other and things going on. It, it's 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 a very good film, and it's very narrated because yeah. it's very quiet. It wasn't an eighties action film. It's a, you said, yeah, it's a it's a drama suspense thriller. Um, it's just the fact that it's in the middle, I guess, middle of the ocean on a boat, and then there's two boats. If you come across, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it's Sam Neill's trying to protect his wife and Billy Zane, who basically wants to murder Sam Neill and take advantage of his wife and you know the point where he actually uh leaves him stranded on his other boat they come across and that's it's, it's taking a water and he has to try and chase after them to get to his own boat and like i said it's a struggle it's, it's, it is it's awesome um fun movie i wish there were right. movies like this oh they tried rebooting this and that was awful um yeah. uh it was dead calm in the, in the theater <laughs> it was did not not a lot of people were watching this when i saw it yeah all right the other movie came out on April 7th, and it's one of my favorites. Um, Major League, man. Tom Berenger, in a, in a goofy movie like this, always throws me off, because he's like the uh, soldier fortune guy. <laughs> this is pretty that. Because, uh, God, what is it? Uh, someone to watch over me. I think it's an old Broadway tune, but it's also the name of a movie where I think he plays a cop that uh, is protecting a woman, and of course, you know, gives her the old uh, little Tom, yeah. if you know what I'm saying. And, yeah. uh, so I think he, Tom was still finding his way through, but Tom, yeah. Tom Berger is a good guy. We like Tom Berger, don't we? Yeah, he's like Tom Berger. Yeah. And uh, I forget what forgot who plays the coach. He has a really raspy voice like this, you know. But it's like I, I just love it. Um, if you're a baseball fan, even if you're not, even if you're not, you don't watch a lot of baseball, but you you know, like, at least enjoy the, this something like this sport. You know, you got Charlie Sheen playing like a hot shots character comes in. He's got punk and he's gonna and he's like he becomes their pitcher. And like I said, this is where we get the whole wow thing, you know, by um, yeah, by uh, Joan Jett, you know, version, uh, which is actually used by John Moxley in AEW Wrestling still. <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I'll just say, uh, was it is, is Wesley Snipes in here too, right? Uh, was he Snipes? I mean, every yeah, single every, <laughs> every, every single baseball player on the team would had, had their own cookie little thing. There was one guy who was into voodoo. <laughs> everything it was just it's like basically it's the misfits you know uh coming together into uh, because the indians were losing so badly they basically it's like um 
it's like the eighties version of the Mark Wahlberg movie, Invincible. You know, where they had trials for the Eagles. Yeah, uh, but they had trials for the Indians, and it's it is basically like I was like, oh my god, here comes anybody, and of course, because when you see when you see Wes, uh, Wesley Snipes comes off, he's like, parks his car, he's like, park over there, and then come in, and it's like, you know, like, let's just say great, and like, let's just it's just re, just a reaction of the coach, and then of course you have the 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 woman who owns the team, and just like you know who wants to sell the team and all that stuff. It's just very it's very fun. Watch it. Second one is okay, but. The, the big the big thing I was I deal with this movie is that Bob Euchre, uh, he's the, he's a former uh, Brewers, yep. Milwaukee Brewers uh, is also is the uh, basically the announcer for this, and I, I just love it. <laughs> it's, I never uh, saw the appeal of Corbin Burns. I mean, he's he's not a bad looking guy at all. No, no. Um, but to me, he he'll always be the dentist because I'm like when I'm watching the psych you know comedy show and all that, and he's like. The, the guy's yeah. father and all that and so he's good in that <laughs> but i'm like oh wait he's the dentist you know because yeah. i don't know he just he never seemed to fit in, in anything to me and no. charlie sheen who cares yeah yeah baseball uh, movie, i i, I do I, I think charlie sheen actually made this it's like charlie sheen made two and a half men yeah i mean yeah. it rides on his ability doesn't it yeah it does yeah it's that kind uh, of you have to have he was i don't know like i said i don't know what he was like as a person at this point if he was on hardcore drugs at this point if that was lately in the 90s but uh but uh, he is pretty good in this. All right, um, April twentieth, Kickboxer. Man, this is a good one. I know it's a canon classic, um, but it, but take the canon thing off of it. This this is a good film. Simple, it's basic. It's yeah. it's, it's nothing surprising about it. Tom Poe's a decent villain, but it's got everything you kind of wanted, and it's got some nice uh, shots being filmed where they're training and with their sequences and the whole thing i mean yeah. we talked about blood sport versus kickboxer and how they're a little different all that but uh this uh, is a revenge for his brother is killed by this guy yeah, people don't realize just how fast van Dam was rocketing up the charts because he's young he's really a good looking guy he's and got the good he's got the good hairstyle haircut and everything he's, you know, he's, he's just naturally uh, primed to be the hero. I mean, he is like young kids, and and even men could look at him and go, "Yeah, I, don't, I can't hate hate on the guy. He's not a douchebag or anything like that. Yeah, he's a little French, whatever like oh. that. But great body, great physique, simple stories, and all the other guys in action are now older, doing goofy ass different things. And here's a young guy that he's looking good and kicking ass. And you go, I like him kicking ass. Thank God yeah. someone's kicking ass. Okay, maybe he'll do it. And he wanted to be in Hollywood so bad that he kind of flamed out once he. Uh, did some of the big movies like Time Cop and all that. He did it to himself, oh, but oh, he, no, Double yeah. Trouble. Just well, you know, <laughs> you know, double up his nose if you know what I'm saying. You know, like a lot of actors and actresses. Oh, but this yeah. is a really good movie. It's worth watching. Like I guess said he did in Hell. We watched that one where you know he has to goes to goes to prison, the Russian right. prison. Yeah, right. he fights there. Like that was a fantastic movie. Um, but definitely, uh, yeah, he has always been. It's weird to see. Like I said, when we watched him in no, it was a No Retreat, No Surrender, he's the bad guy. Yeah. And he didn't fit for me. That's what I was, that whole room for the movie. I was like, it doesn't fit. And there's no way this little kid's going to take out Jean Claude Van Damme. I was like, there's no way. Um, well, when, but, when, you, when you think of JCD, first thing comes to mind Bloodsport. Well, I was going to say Street Fighter. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, because I because I remember that's the first movie I watched with him back in the day, and even though it's, it's like it's very Lucy, but I mean the the, the whatever his name the Raw guy who played um Bison the big, big villain there was awesome in there, and then you had Jean Claude Van Damme as the the American guy, and then you had uh, named Soto, she's in License to Kill, she's also played Vampirella movie. Oh okay. There. Yeah, she's she was in I believe she was in there too. She played I think she played Kung Lee. Or, or, or no 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 it's not her no Chun Li it was, was um Ming Nan Yuan was in there like I said so I mean but it, yeah like I said Kickboxer Bloodsport and like Street Fighter are the big things I remember for this you know but honestly I think his best movie was Time Cop oh well, he would have you believe that yes. but he's not <laughs> the the to me this is the essence of who he is this film here it's it's not I I can understand what you're saying about Time yeah. Cop I just I'll just gonna hardly disagree with you on that it, it, it was his crossover film to make him at the same level as arnie and stallone, stallone and all that. yeah yeah but you, look at the, you look at the background that stallone and arnold had really kind of going up and again stallone's going back to what mid-70s early 70s yeah. same thing with arnold if you uh, think our, about it our target 
was the other one he had too as well is he punches the snake yeah i mean uh but it just <laughs> yeah. this is not actually a bad franchise mm-hmm. either no um my only complaint is that he kind of left the franchise and then he got Sasha Mitchell from Step by Step, Cody, <laughs> uh, cousin Cody took over. I was like, really? This guy? Yeah. And, then, and then I think the latest was what, was Scott Atkins one of the guys in here? Um, I think no, Batista was uh, Tong Po, one of them. I just yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I just remember it got a little slightly rebooted. Yeah. But they kept the numbering, which really threw me off. But uh, anyway, going on to our next one. Our next one uh, came out in May 19th. That is, uh, we're halfway here now. We're at number five. This is Roadhouse. I want you to be nice. So it's not time to not be nice. <laughs> um, a lot, a lot of controversy. I mean, not a lot of controversy, but a lot of popularity with this movie so, I mean, back then. And especially today now. Especially the fact that they're, Jake Gyllenhaal has been doing a reboot of this. Yeah, uh, which is basically they've said that it's going to be an action movie and, and not really like what this was. This was kind of uh, your thriller kind of with a little bit of action season here, but not too much action. I, I You and I had this uh, disagreement backstage. I thought the current trailer for Roadhouse is actually a good trailer. That does not mean the movie is going to be good. No. But I can see what you're saying with their one turn on action movie and emphasizing all that. Because I think, obviously, despite the physique and Conor McGregor and all the different little pops and twists mm-hmm. they're going to put in it, it just doesn't have Patrick Swayze's charm that everything It just around. seems like, it seems to me, when I, when I, especially when I look at the Jake Gyllenhaal, I look, it's, it's going to have, the only story it's going to be is just him just fighting. It's just going to be, it's just going to be, a, that's it, nothing else. It's, it's not going to be as far as anything with the Roadhouse whatsoever. The yeah. Roadhouse, yeah, so they, and there's going to be like a Miami thing. I was just like, why are you changing it up a lot? You know, you have the simple uh, premise. You just got all you had to do is have a guy come in, stranger off the street, uh, work at a bar as a bouncer, and that's really all you need to do. And so, don't put it in Florida or Miami, whatever you're doing. That keep keep it like, like what this was. This was uh, was this Missouri, right? I don't go, know somewhere yeah, in the south. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, like I said, it was like I think it was like I think, oh I think they're in Jackson, Missouri. Uh, okay. Anyway. Anyway, but like I said, it was simple. And uh, unlike Jake Gyllenhaal, um, uh, if you do Patrick Swayze, he's a tall dude. You get no, Swayze's, well, he's a lean guy. He's a ballerina dancing kind of guy, right? He, he's uh, he's your roller skating guy. That's uh, true. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, he, came, he, skated, he skated his way into this, you know, and then uh, he had Sam Elliott. The supporting character in this, and then he like said the musician who was blind, who actually was blind in real life, and was like, he was able to play guitar yep. and stuff. That's how he did I, it. I, yeah, it was it was fun. Um, it's so, fun. It, it, it's a fun. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's and this, uh, this should have this should have been a canon classic, but it was United Artists. <laughs> well, it's funny because I was going to ask you, how did you think? How did the movie like look to you the way it was filmed? I thought it was filmed pretty decently. Yeah. Um, like you said, they really foc- they really focused on him, like especially the being the new guy in town and seeing people getting get out, getting getting uh, shaked down by this other guy because this guy wants to basically own this whole town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and at the end, you get the kick. <laughs> it's, yeah. just, it's it's a it's a Chuck Norris movie. <laughs> it's true, it is, and, and that, that's what we want. And that's what we get. The guy that shot this, uh, Dean Cunney, he's the same guy that did a lot of. Yeah. The films I mark about with Halloween and the fog and all that, but he also, of course, just got off of doing uh, this this little tiny film uh, yeah. called Back to the Future and all that stuff. Roadhouse, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? I mean, mm-hmm. this is a good looking film. When, when I when I see the trailer for the for the new one, I go, Yeah, it looks like an action film. They could have called it Miami House, and I wouldn't have known any better, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it could have been like the same setup, right? Like an anthology. Then you could have Atlanta House or you it's, know whatever. It's and it's kinda... just body. Yeah, it's it's got nothing none of the charm of the, of the first movie at all. It's, and it, it doesn't seem like. And that's why it's yeah, it's it, the the new movie is in same sense that we we watched the movie called Joker. You could have called it anything else, but because it wasn't a Joker movie, it had nothing really to do with DC whatsoever. Right. Yeah. So it's like the same thing, with Jake Ellen. You could call you're going to call a Roadhouse, but it's not Roadhouse. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I, I don't. I mean, it might be a good movie, but it's going straight to Prime. I hear, right? It's not even going to theaters. I don't even know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> who knows? Who can keep up with these all these uh, damn different schedules today? I don't know. Everything's even delayed. Um. 
our next one came on May 24th. And arguably probably the best in the series, maybe even better than the first one. Uh, this is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Or we just call it Last Crusade. That's how I just call it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, everything that we talked about in our movie matchup, uh, Movie Thunder, Dome, where two movies enter and one leaves, still remains. If you haven't checked that out, do it. It's a phenomenal movie. Definitely one of the best. And, and yeah, it might be the best of the three. I mean, we'll have to debate that one time. But phenomenal movie, nothing, nothing really more to say about it that obviously this would be it was, in your top two or three, I think, for the year. Easy. The reason I liked it more, I mean, in taking out the Sean Connery part, is the fact it's the search for the Holy Grail, which is kind of going back to in, 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 in the first movie was just for the Ark of the Covenant. Yep. Both are connected to Christ, yep. so basically uh, ancient stuff. I, so I was actually things are actually are said to be real, where the Temple of Doom was just like, oh, uh, take your heart out and sacrifice it, and then you know dunk in the lava. As I was like, if I want a still yeah. beating heart ripped out of a man's chase, uh, uh, chest. I'm either going to watch Roadhouse for the throat scene, or yeah, I'm going to watch yeah, some oh, really yeah. bad ninja movies. I don't need yeah. Indiana Jones. <laughs> I want I want <laughs> history stuff. Agreed. <laughs> that was a kung fu hustle. Yeah, one of them had the heart film. I was like, boom, boom. Jim Carrey did it better. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, that's I'm thinking. I couldn't remember what movie it was. Uh, dumb and Dumber. <laughs> puts in a little grocery bag. <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but definitely Sean Connery does improve the film a lot. Yeah. They should have, I mean, man, imagine you had Sean Connery in the second movie with Temple of Doom. I can't see it. <laughs> Hang on, Indy. We'll go for a ride. Eat that heart, Indy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But after, after talking about <laughs> Temple How many of more Doom, do we have left, sir? We, we have, after this one, we have three more. All right, three so, more. Our, our t- so not our top three, but the last three of '89. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. July fourteenth. License to Kill. This is the best Dalton, even though there's only two of them, and the I best, would argue this is one of the better of ones. Period. Yeah, and it's, and you know what? I I put I put him up there as one of the best Bond films. This is your back to basics Bond, and our uh, Roger Moore review that Professor Pixel and I just recently released on Thursday. Uh, we've got a couple mm-hmm. hundred views already, which is nice. We both came to the same conclusion independently that for your eyes only as a back to the basics after Moonraker type foolishness is legitimate bond. And that's the one where you go, man, bond can be really, really great. Even if they do the same formula license to kill proves it. I, I think everything's on point here. The ladies are fabulous. Mm-hmm. The bad guy, the setup, it's a, it's a simple revenge film, right? Vamp- oh, this Vampirella. is so good. And, and it's got a Florida presence in it too. Yeah, am I Vampirella right? is uh, Robert, Robert Davi's girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is good. That this the women are tremendous, and and this is one of the and first movies where the women are 100 percent not just knockouts. They're vital to the story. They're not just dumb figureheads. Do you know who was also here? It was what makes me great because not only have Robert Davi as, as the main villain, and you see his, Toro is his head. Yes, his, his, his head. Yes, yeah, yes. pretty boy. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh... <laughs> No, I, I after this one I went wow. I didn't I didn't mind the Living Daylights. It was kind of lighthearted and goofy. License well, to Kill fucking dials it in, bro. And I'm like, right. I was like, is this? Yeah, okay, I'm waiting for the next one. With is Dalton this the one it. where uh, Felix Leiter dies? Correct. Yes, I, the sharks. Yeah, no, Davi is what it should be. It modernizes the Bond villain instead of these stupid secret underground lair bullshit. You get this friggin' pimp ass drug dealer estate with some great stuff this is a great movie the this, this truck is a nice scene one. yeah they had all the it was the you're driving dump trucks full of uh, diamonds and stuff right or well the, the dump truck or at the end is this is, is like he gives when they're when they're chaining him they're putting him in there and they're going over the bridge it's like you know my offer still stands a million dollars wherever it is you know if you can get if you can free me and sure enough people come and they free him and all that too and he is extremely low he's it, it's like scaramanga in a way but better yeah he's yeah. the flip side of bond just in a different thing that's what makes it great Th- those interactions between those two in a way I, davi davi's i'm not gonna say he saves this film he just he's two levels above any other bond villain basically yeah. he's that good like you said they decided to kill off felix lighter i was just like dang i was like was not expecting that <laughs> going out like bullshit where they did in the last friggin film my god yeah it was some yeah. class for god's sakes all right speaking of class we're going to Batman. 
Uh, this is June 23rd. Jack Nicholson, Michael Keaton. This is what started off as far as we're getting all the Batman movies. The first, you know, of course, you, you, some could say you had the Batman 66, but to me, that doesn't really count. That's just a, a made-for-TV movie. Yeah. Yeah. Be uh, be based off the series. This is Keaton, man. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Uh, this is, uh, hey, where the fuck is 4K? You know? <laughs> uh, honestly, Jack Nicholson, his name's before Michael Keaton. I never noticed that. Now I understand why, because as much as I love Keaton, Nicholson had the the performance, the best performance in here. He still had some umph behind him when, when he oh. wanted to. Um, and, but I again, like we talked about in our matchup, I think believe it was Batman versus Indy Three. That uh, this is the movie that solidified Michael Keaton to me. I, I never was a big fan of him, didn't hate him. He was just sort of there. But yeah. like I mentioned before, with uh, taking Liam Neeson, once you find what works for you, milk it. And uh, Keaton, of course, I don't think he played Batman in, in any other times. I don't know if there was talks, serious talks about him coming back or doing something. But he was I thought he was tremendous in this. He came back for Batman Two, uh, that uh, Batman Returns. And, uh, and they were supposed to come back for Batman Forever, but uh, Tim Burton was going to was going to was going to be attached, so he didn't want to be attached to it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. And Jack Nicholson had said in a recent interview, or at least in the past couple of years, he said the Joker is his favorite role because you're so free to be evil and do what you want to do. And he said, I he said, and kids love to be scared. So he's like, I, I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do this. He's like, that's why he signed on for this project. He just had fun. He's like, I'm going to be the creepiest one of this. And he was to yeah. this day. He's still the creepiest Joker. I think the wire yeah. that they put in his, in his lips to hold that up, but that's much better than yeah. any of the shit from the last one. I like the Dark Knight with, with uh, Ledger. It's a different Joker. Yep. I mean, yeah, so I mean, it was still good. But I mean, I I can't. I mean, you have, then you have Gotham, they have their own version with the face kind of cut off and just taking. But well, of course, at this point, you know, too, and um, there really there was some good stories with Joker, but like you know, we started getting some other ones in the in the ninety late late nineties and the two thousand started getting some uh, Batman stories. But mm-hmm. like I said, Nicholson commands a room when he's there. You know, he just has that voice. You know. That's why whenever I see Christian Slater, it's just like he's like he he recognizes game and he says, "I'm going to steal Nicholson's game because it works." I, I, I don't know the story behind it. I really okay. don't because I heard that uh, description when he was young. Uh, yeah. I don't know where it came from, but Jack Nicholson, I look at him and go, "He's not ugly and he ain't hot, but he's got yeah. charisma." I mean, and so you know, talking yeah. about trying he's, to sound other movies he's done. Are people you, are you like saying that. he's got what the kids say he's got riz? Uh, I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> all right um uh, this movie's been talked to death yeah. if you haven't seen this movie go watch it if you have seen it go watch it again uh don't go watch the flash <laughs> i don't care mike keen's in there i don't want to see it um all right or number nine uh july 7th <laughs> Dipl- diplomatic immunity didn't revoke <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh hot girl gets bumped off uh we learn about what really happened to uh Mel Gibson's character's wife uh and uh yeah it's a uh, evil German guy uh is uh he's uh yeah is using his diplomatic immunity to get away uh, you know skirt the law and uh yeah fun scenes man how is his House gets blown up. His little trailer home on the beach gets blown up. How dare they? And they, they tried to kill him and his dog. And they killed his girl. Who used to work for the, the German guy. I, I will say this. I think it's fine. I do think it's forgettable. It's not a bad film. We really like the first one. Um, Joe it, Pesci's in this, though. So how can you not forget this one? <laughs> Because Joe Pesci's in it, I don't like it. Although, I get here. Uh, if you didn't watch this movie, it wouldn't hurt you. Now it was a monster hit. Don't get me wrong; people liked it, but it just wasn't the same as the first one. You know, it's, oh yeah, they, 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 not of them. Without, it's very rare you get a movie or as a sequel that actually is somewhat argued better, like, like James Cameron Terminator Two. Some say it's better than the first one. 
the um one of the guys who did the story here of course we mentioned how shane black uh, has written some yeah. interesting stuff in the 80s and since he was a part on here but the guy's name that's attached to this i wanted to bring up because we mentioned it a few weeks ago when we did 1985 warren murphy he's the guy that's behind the whole um destroyer books which was where the film yeah. Freeman williams came from so i thought it was interesting you had somebody that did all this too now this guy also uh in addition to doing all that stuff he he did one of the better spy movies you and I really like with Jack Nicholson at the Iger Sanction. And I'm like, man, this guy's, you know, they had, you think about this, this is the late mm -hmm. 80s and it's a sequel of an action film that they and don't have Shane to. And it's Black. And, and then, but they, they still have what you would consider heavyweights behind them in terms of writing ability. Not just, writing a script is one thing, writing books is another. Being able to do both is not the easiest yeah. thing, but translating them over that, they still had it behind them. I mean, um, yeah. so yeah. it's, it's good. I, I just, yeah, you know, when you say the comedy part to this, I kind of almost liked the, the tone of the first one better, but that's just my that's just my uh, take on it. Yeah, I guess uh, like the first one was a much more different take because Riggs was actually suicidal, and this one he's actually got happiness. He's not suicidal anymore towards the end of the first. Like movie, the first so. movie didn't exist. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of weird. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, it's it's kind of like it's like, it's still enjoyable. I, it's uh, unlike uh, Predator Two, which is a horrible sequel, <laughs> uh, or I guess you would call it a sequel. You just call it a reboot because it doesn't have Arnold in it whatsoever. Um, yeah, but like I said, this is Shane Black who went on to direct Iron Man Three. So when you go watch, like I said, I, I, I swear by this, watch this movie and then go watch Iron Man Three after this it is scene for scene of the same it's the same story same formula he uses in this one uh hero hero uh, you know gets you know loses home uh loses a girl you know down in his down his luck as evil villain and yeah you can see it side by side it is it is insane how shane black just recycles this movie <laughs> but uh anyway our last movie is probably one of the best john candy movies i've seen uh, other than planes, trains, and automobile and a great outdoors, this is Uncle Buck. Yeah. Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, this came out, uh, I believe, in uh, August 16th. Yeah. And uh, I, I hate Home Alone, but I but I, I prefer Macaulay, <laughs> I prefer Macaulay Culkin in this. This is this was better. This was better than Macaulay Culkin's Home Alone. And I'm. I know people are like, well, Home Alone is, is how do you not like Home Alone? I've it's seen, annoying. It's, <laughs> That's why. It's, it's, I've seen it like 20 times. <laughs> and not by, not by my choice. I saw it maybe once or twice by my choice. And after that, it's like, of course, because now I'm older now. I got, I got nieces and nephews. They're like, oh, I want to watch this. I'm like, no, you don't. You want to? You, if you're going to watch any Home Alone movies, you're going to watch the second one because that's Donald Trump in it, bro. I'm 45. Uh uh no but like i said this was i love this and we've we've had e on the channel before talking about this you know where he's like you know he's, he's you know he's when he's trying to scare the the older the older oldest uh, uh his niece his older his oldest daughter yeah and and basically he's scare the, the the punk you know he's like hey your your, your name's a gnat you know hatchet oh i split a, a, a gnat you're oh my gosh you're an insect, you know. I, those are, it's the same, net, you know, net, net. It's like I looks like always. He just takes the hatchet out, sharpening. He's like he's gonna trunk his car. His car backfires. It sounds like so when he pulls this, drop him off, it backfires. Everything, everybody's afraid there's a shooting. And the thing is that back then you could laugh about that. Yeah, it's that, not a big deal. Yeah, and it's a John Humes film, uh, which was probably one of his last great movies he did. Because after this, it's Al Bundy, right? Well, we did. We covered Dutch, like was it yeah. like two or whatever. Or yeah. Or whatever. Um, I don't think there was really any John Hughes. Who, there might be a few. I don't. I'm, I don't. Can't recall. I think they were all in the '80s, pretty much. Well, no, he had a chunk in the '90s, but you wouldn't really know that because he no. didn't really direct any, any. I think he directed one or no. two more, and that's it. But he wrote. He wrote several more up until when he. Uh, you know, past. I, the thing with John Hughes is I, I have a love-hate relationship with his films because I think he's got a great tone to him. Uh, he definitely gets a lot of the right people in the right roles for what he's mm -hmm. doing. I do also kind of blame him for the uh, romanticizing, just how swell the 80s were and how everything's <laughs> perfect, but it's just, you know, 
really rich kids from from rich backgrounds in rich Chicago northern suburbs, and it's cool and all that, but it's it does it just lacks the grittiness of with the reality of what most high schools experiences are up to this point. But it, it but he does it so damn good. And, but, and damn it, John Candy's phenomenal in this. He's romancing uh, as far as Chicago, making Chicago look great and stuff. You know, uh, you Agreed. know, he's. Blues Brothers was another movie, you know. <laughs> they were in the train, the train goes by, and they're on their room. They're just shaking on the bed and just kind of like falling around. Same thing with him. Here he lives, you know. And he lives in uh, Skull. He's but uh, John Candy. Uh, I'll say this yeah. more for my last comment. He was. Um, I think he got a start on SCTV, which is what Second City Television. Yeah. I think it was Canadian or might have been out of Chicago, but somewhere up there. And a lot of people that are really popular today. Um, the, you know, Martin Short's another one too. They're all Canadian up there, Toronto area. And Candy, I remember him from that going, okay, this guy's got some stuff. And he was in a few low brow type movies in the early 80s before he started hitting it big. But man, those guys just have tons of talent. And when you watch some of the old skits that they're in, you're mm -hmm. like, man, people wouldn't even do that kind of humor today. And, and it's just really, really good. And the one show that, um, I can't even remember the names, but it was really popular for a while. Half hour one that had a bunch of people. The guy with the bushy eyebrows that was an American Pie and all those other ones. His son. Oh, Eugene did. Levy. Yeah, and um, and his wife, the character, the lady that plays his wife in this TV show. They're like rich people that basically uh, have to live poor. And they don't. Have, they're, they're learning how to adapt. That's the comedy behind it. Funny show, but the writing on it. All those guys have been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years. Candy himself yeah. should he have been alive. Yeah, Ken, Candy was really, really great. I, there's nobody really like him right now. Yeah, I miss him. He's yeah. just a fun guy. You know, you think of playing trains and automobiles and Uncle Buck, you're like, man, this is, he's just that kind of guy. I, I don't know how to explain it. He He's the perfect at being the the crass, you know, he said, he's, he's, he's crude, he's crass, but he's also family. That's perfectly described if anybody who, if he had uh, any nieces or nephews, you know, in real life, <laughs> he's, he's John Candy. Uh, I don't know how much is actually was him, you know, or, or versus like being a character or, you know, but uh, he said he was, he excelled at it. Just yeah. like, just, just like you had um, uh, Chris Farley excelled at being the obnoxious guy over a week and all. And uh, especially you see when Tommy, Tommy Boy and said Black Sheep, you know. Uh, yeah, he said like this. That's what he excelled at, and that's what made him really cool. And he, he was tall. He wasn't just short. He wasn't short fat. He was tall too. So uh, like I guess I, I think, I think Uncle Buck in Planes, Trains, and Automobile is my are my two favorite movies by him. Yeah. And then because he went, he went on he, after this. He went on to um in the early nineties did a cartoon called Camp Candy, did voice acting. Yeah, yeah. I have not seen that. It, it, it was good. I, I remember. I remember like being like seven years old watching it. I was like, it was like, like. Then I got older. Like, Camp Candy. Oh my gosh, it's freaking John Candy at his own cartoon. You know, at a camp for kids stuff, and he always getting the shenanigans and stuff going on. So I was like, it was, it was fun. That's interesting. Yes. All right. Anything but, you uh, get off your chest or something you need to pimp uh, uh, off my chest? So uh, I need to go grab my baseball bat and wake up Pixel. Uh, Professor Pixel decided to uh, sleep in again tonight. Well, we'll be actually, now that it's official, starting to record next week, and you guys will see here at Offline on Thursdays is our mm -hmm. Thursday show dropping. We're actually going to do the first season of the original TV show, Columbo. Not the pilot episode or episodes, but starting with the, the book Murder One, I think it was seven, eight episodes that season. The original Columbo show, we will be doing that on the weekly dro drops, so check that out. Um, I think it's an interesting choice to just watch the first episode stunned by how good it was and, and considering i'm not the biggest colombo guy in the world but uh definitely for a show that's over 50 years old i'm like man this is pretty tight i know everybody's yep. you know talking about um this show that's out now on peacock that's got the girl in it that's got this thing to it and it's just it's like they, they just fail fail miserably here you got a wow really strong uh, mo uh episode to talk about too so we'll see when that drops here very soon but um i don't have anything else other than tuesday night yeah. i think we have a decision made already don't we yep and that would be well Tuesday night. We're going to be going back to some uh, well, not the basics. Yeah, well, the basics. We're going back to our kicking at roots. We're going to go to some martial arts. We're going to get some uh, Cynthia Khan come back. We're going to do in the line of duty number three, uh, which is also available on Tubi TV right now. So yes. uh, we already did uh, one, two, and four. So we figured we'll get the third movie in there. So we have a nice little uh, roll or a run of this. And like I said. Um, 
fun. I love I love eighties martial arts stuff, especially especially in, in Japan, in the Japan base, because mm -hmm. I love seeing how adapted they are to the Western culture. They are. It, it's just it's just fun. Yeah, yeah. It'll be a, it'll be a fun uh, watch what Tuesday night. Yeah. We'll do that. Yep. Anything else? No, nope, that's about it. All, All right, right, guys. Thanks for watching, listening. Have a good night. Stay extreme. Anything else? Well, Sound like you had something. No, I was gonna say we'll see you on Tuesday nights. There you go. Good night now. <laughs>